And it has been uh, actually wonderful to come back to New Haven and to Yale. It's a big pleasure to see that the building is still here and still one recognizes not only the building but some of the faces. So it was a nice experience to get back. Thanks for inviting me. Today we'll talk to you a little bit about heat waves in a changing climate. And I think the subject heat wave is one that will become more and more important if climate change proceeds as we believe. And one reason is is really th that our climate uh, will experience some warming and so whether this warming effect summer or winter will be, make a big difference. For instance in winter you see here how you could define the climate as the distribution of uh, annual or, or seasonal mean temperature and now if there is some shift in climate as we uh, anticipate that this would happen it would look something like that and you see that actually every second year from the future climate which still classify kind of the cold uh, winter, so winter years would classify as warm winter years today. So nothing completely new. And actually the other half, this will overlap with other seasons. So winter season in the extratropics is nothing completely new in a, after climate change. But in summer, the situation looks kind of different. Actually, if we think of a warming, which maybe is a little larger in summer, four and a half degrees, then we yield an essentially new climate. So this, the distribution of years that we will see in the future might well be completely different. So the summer will deliver an unexperienced climate to us. Now I will, uh, and of course this will be associated also with a number of heat waves. I will be showing you some examples. I will first look a little back and look into a couple of historical heat waves that had made uh, some influence on how we think about heat waves today. I will present you a little bit about what I call the variability hypothesis. I will show you a little information on recent scenarios that is uh, so recent modeling results and their anticipated scenarios for heat waves. And then we will look into two specific aspects of heat waves that play an important role in uh, how these features develop. Now, to, to begin with, the first example is the North American drought, 1988. And this is an interesting story because this uh, the diagram to the left shows you the precipitation anomaly from April to June. And you see that there was a, this was down to 10% of the normal precipitation in a large area of North America. And only a few months back in December, there was a paper published by Kevin Trenbers in Science. And this paper had the title, origins of the 1988 North American drought. So the same year the issue was resolved. And actually, uh, nobody questions the conclusion of that paper. So it was immediately accepted that this drought had been caused by large-scale quasi-stationary Rossby wave patterns. You see this here. These wave patterns stretching or starting in the Central Pacific in response to anomalous sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. So it was a strong... Uh, La Nina event. And this, this North American drought also brought a number of studies on the role of land surface processes in a drought, and uh, some of that actually has been done also at uh, Yale at that time. Now, another big heat wave that came up seven years later in North America was the Chicago heat wave. And the unusual thing about the Chicago heat wave was the extremely high temperature that occurred, uh, were, were observed during day times, uh, during night times. And so what you see here are apparent temperature, so combining the influence of heat and moisture stress. And you see that over this period considered here, the mean temperature, the mean max temperature was 48 degree centigrade, the apparent temperature. And even the minimum temperature is this, the nighttime temperature in the middle was 27 degrees, up to 30 degrees. So these are extremely high nighttime temperature, temperature, and they were later being identified as being the main cause behind one of the results of this heat wave name, and this was a, a large number of heat deaths. So there were, I think, about 800 victims of that heat wave in Chicago, in the town of Chicago alone. And this heat wave was the first, probably, when that was realized on a grand proportion, and there was then a later paper published in a bulletin where with the title Impacts and Responses to the 1995 Heat Wave, A Call to Action. And this paper, you, 
something is pointed out that still today we are not really aware of, namely that in the annual average, probably heat waves is the worst e meteorological event available in terms of casualty. It's, you see here the numbers for the United States, tornadoes, heavy floods, maybe 100, 200 casualties, but heat waves, estimated number of 1,000. And the maximum event, it goes down to here 10,000 uh, casualties estimated for 1980 and a uh, similar amount for the heat wave in 1901. So that heat wave actually is, a, is a really important uh, for us. And a few years later, so maybe I should say what, how this was perceived in Europe. So first in Europe, they, there were some heat waves, but nothing was in the category where we would be concerned about health effects. And so when the European heat wave 2003 came up, you see here some pictures, a river close to where I live, and here the temperature anomaly of that heat wave. This heat wave did hit really an, un uh, an unprecedented heat wave, did struck an unprepared society. And I can show you this both for, more first for the impacts of the heat wave, which were quite dramatic. So you see here some data from France, so you see the excess mortality, which is the mortality above the long-term mean as a function of time, starting from August 1 to November 30. And you see the first two weeks, which were the first two, which is the strongest heat waves in this particular case, and you see how the mortality rate exceeds the long-term average by 150% on the national average. So that means that if you go to the hotspots of that heat wave, which were south to Paris, then actually there, there were large areas where, where mortality was 300 and 400% above long-term mean. And so this event was noticed right when it started because it flooded the hospitals in many areas, and so the hospitals often were not able to take all emergency uh, incoming uh, people into custody, so some of them here stayed on the gangway. This was a noticeable in the time when it happened. It was also argued later, and rightly probably so, that this was a big societal failure in that August was the vacation months, and unexperienced young doctors stayed in the hospital. They experienced with their family usually. They took the August off. Nobody was around. Hospitals were understaffed. Difficult situation. So we have learned a lot from this heat wave, and uh, so one interesting thing is that normally with a heat wave there is something like a harvesting effect. And maybe you have heard this uh, term, so it's a, actually a medical term, and it quickly explains, so the argument is that the heat wave at first round will kill the elderly people, maybe ill people that are not so resistant to these uh, stress factors. And so if that happens, if then, of course, you would expect that following the, such a heat wave, there will be a dip below the regular mortality curve. Because those that haven't been killed, or that those that were killed in this period could not be killed here. And this is not the case here. So what we see actually that this affected people that were not just up to die, now I put it in these words, in the next weeks or so, but they, they, they uh, had some more reasonable stretch to live ahead of them. And actually the heat wave, the effect this heat wave had been noticed in uh, statistical data throughout all age categories. I show you now, so this, this is for France, and this was available almost in real time in 2003 because French is a centralized country which has a death registry in Paris, which uh, everything is available there. And to collect the figures for all of Europe, to, took much longer and there is now an estimated figure of an excess mortality of 70,000 people. So a huge amount, you see it here, the distribution here, excess mortality of more than 200%, almost 300% in large areas. And you see how basically all European countries were affected, not only the French with their casual uh, August vacation. So this shows that it was a, a it did hit an unprepared society, but it also was an unprecedented event. And I show you that here, taking figures now from Switzerland. So these are Swiss temperature series, marked each year as a bar, and then comes 2003. 
a year that is far away from the distribution and one can actually go down and make some estimates of the return period, which is a little dangerous, but because one has to make assumption about the statistics, but you see that everything that is beyond 20 years, according to the Gaussian estimate, has a return period of more than 1,000 years. So it's very rare that you should expect that. So or actually, one should not expect this event. And it is a 5.4 sigma event. So it was a tremendous event that uh, at the time nobody was prepared to. And then the really amazing thing was that it took only a few years later, seven years later, in 2010, was another heat wave, the great Russian heat wave. And so you might recall there were huge air, uh, forest fires in Russia and dramatic problems with air quality conditions in large parts of Russia. And uh, again, there was a huge estimate of S excess mortality. But on a continental scale, uh, this actually turned out to be even a stronger heat wave than 2003. I should say now this figure here is a little an other scale here. Before here we looked at the scale of Switzerland and here we look at the uh, continental scale of Europe and so on this continental scale including this Russian heat wave, the area of this Russian heat wave is was even worse. What's the range? Oh I should say, so this is, this is two degrees off norm plus and two degrees minus. So this is on the European scale. So before, actually, here you saw that we have, are more than five degrees above normal, which is on the local scale. And this classifies more as a heat wave. So the two degrees, of course, would not really affect, directly affect the population. But it occurred over, as part of this heat wave over a long period. So if you think of how to name, actually, the heat, the drought and heat waves you had in recent years, maybe you should learn a little bit from Europe, because in Europe we called this wave, then this heat wave here, the great European heat waves. And only seven years later there is one that is even greater. And so we have to call this one now the great Russian heat wave, <laughs> which is a little illogical. <laughs> and, okay. Now, uh, maybe we can recap some of that by saying that heat waves are a major impact factor. I have highlighted only here the human health issue. There are issue with agriculture. For instance, the European heat wave 2003, it had ag agricultural damage in about the, at the value of about $10 billion, meaning it's like the size of a hurricane. There were also big issues about electricity, freshwater resources, and of course concern how that will change with climate change. And we have also seen that these past events, they actually have served to identify some of the elements of these heat waves, then these unusual large scale dynamics, often triggered by the oceanic circulations. And uh, we know from several investigations that there are land surface atmosphere feedbacks, meaning there are some interplay between heat waves and droughts. Now, several of the heat waves that we have seen, they don't really fit the statistics of the past. They appear very unusual, and to discuss that, I will first now guide you quickly through this variability hypothesis. So what you see on the, so the basic idea of how this heat wave could come about with climate change is plotted here. That actually you have this distribution, so this would be the definition of climate, maybe I should go back. So this is temperature and the frequency, and the tails of these distributions would be the extremes. And of course, if you change the distribution, then the frequency of the extremes based on previous definitions would, could change dramatically. And this has been the argument that IPCC has been making since actually the second IPCC report. Now it turns out if you, you try to use this model to explain a five sigma event, then it's very difficult because the natural variability, internal variability is about one sigma. And the warming up to now was about 1K, which also comes from about 1 sigma. So even if you account for the mean warming, the shift, it's very hard to explain a 5 sigma event. So, uh, but there is another hypothesis to do that, and this is uh, these changes in variability that you could actually, rather than shifting the distribution, you could increase the variability, and this would lead to 
an increase in the frequency of extreme warm and cold conditions if one takes the variability al alone. And of course, one would take a combination of these two factors. And this hypothesis has been studied some time ago, actually 1992, a very re worth reading publication. And in this publication, they say variability is more important than mean. So if you really lo are looking for extremes far away from the mean, <coughs> then the changes in variability are the key factor to be concerned. Now to study it, this is now several years old as an introduction, I show you some uh, analysis we did in 2003 and 2004 using a climate change setup with a global model and a regional model. And uh, so we are looking at control slices, basically 100 year jump into the future. And we plot our results in a similar way as we have plotted the observations before. So this would be now a grid point near Zurich and this would be the controlled climate, 1961 to 1990. And you see that for this grid point at least, it's a little worse if first or south, the observations, they fit almost perfectly with the simulations. And if you do then the scenario integrations, you see exactly the effect which uh, or this issue that what we see is not only a shift in the distribution, but is a shift in temperature by some amount, plus also an increase in variability. And this increase in variability makes extremes up here possible, which appear unreachable in the control uh, simulations. Now this pattern of variability increase has a, it has a geographical pattern associated with it. I show it that to you on the next slide. You see here the, from the same simulations, the summer mean temperatures uh, shift the warming of that. And you see that there is this north-south gradient with comparatively small warming up here and large warming down here. And here then the variability change expressed in percent. So there is an area a fairly large area of variability changes where this, uh, where this increase in variability uh, is simulated. And interestingly enough, this variability change is not collocated with the change in mean temperature, but occurs further north. Now the effect of that on the climate, you can just pick out one grid point and it's uh, it, it is pick, depicted here, namely that from a variability pattern which resembles what we have today, there is a substantially increased variability which would make it much more difficult actually to do agriculture in such a climate because there is a kind of unexpected changes uh, from year to year. And so together this combine also to the warming and the increase in variability to increase the frequency of very warm summers and warm heat waves. And this issue about, uh, we have seen already here that actually this, there is a pattern which is, which is very specific to these changes. For instance, for the Iberian Peninsula, we would expect uh, dominate uh, that these changes in, uh, in occurrence of heat wave was dominated now by the mean warming because there was little variability change. While further north, let's say in France and Germany, there would be large, facts, uh, large uh, impacts of this change in variability. And if you do this now on the daily statistics and look at the temperature distribution, this is what the models suggest. You see here France where this is the control climate in blue. This is the temperature and it's merely histogram. And you see that now the scenario climate, we observe a shift to the warmer end, but also a widening of the distribution leading to an increase in a heavy events or very hot events. While in the Iberian Peninsula, we find that actually this distribution has some, uh, is not symmetric. And we see this shift, but very little change actually in variability. Maybe some change in skewness, so you see that there's a right end part of that here has become steeper. I should say that for these particular model simulations, these uh, simulations the, from the current climate fit the observations surprising well. You see here in black now the observations for the same time period using the so-called EOPS data, which is a daily 
greedy data set covering all of Europe and here the control climate showing a good agreement. The characteristics, difference between these two distributions with skewness in the up, in, in, or in Iberian Peninsula is captured by the simulations. I think there is a question. I, sorry, I didn't see you. So, so in order to, is there any reason why you have to reduce the, the number of, of events in order to expand the range? Or can you have just, an, can you just maintain the same number of events and expand the range? Because you know, you're, you're reducing your amplitude with, you know, in this predictive model. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we should go back here to, yeah, yeah. on the left hand side you mean? Yeah. Well in principle you could also have a shift and some change of skew skewness and some change of variability and you would not amplify the, the number of events on the right hand side. But with climate change and, and warming, so we should just recall that maybe the widths of these distributions are a few degrees, depending on extent monthly or, or daily data. And the warming is also a few degrees. So it's really impossible to have a substantial shift without changing the extremes. Because we, we shift this distribution by substantial amounts comparable with the variability, meaning the width of the distribution itself. Not sure I'm completely answered. Not, not really what I'm asking. You're reducing the, the variability, the frequency, in the, in the red, this is a model result. Yeah. So the model result is reducing the frequency in the in the in the in the highest amount in the in the highest probability in terms of yeah. frequency. And I'm wondering why that has to happen. Why can't you maintain the same frequency within a wider range? Yeah. Of just just normalized. That's right. Just normalized. Yeah. So, so the area below these two curves is the same. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if you widen it, it has to be this way. If it's a simple widening, yeah. I did think of a more complicated answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, I should say before I we will look a little bit into the process. So, uh, I should show you what the scenarios, recent scenarios say in comparison, also maybe to the kind of former older scenarios I've showed just uh, just now. And we should do this first now in an analysis of CME five AR five models. This is the most recent climate simulations available on the global scale, and, I, and they have been analyzed. I actually got the data only a few weeks ago by Erich Fischer, a collaborator of mine. And so what you see here is now, the, what is plotted here is the change in northern hemisphere summer 99th percentile. And so this is uh, actually a useful quantity because it would be like, this is the warming that would affect the hottest summer days. Summer has 90 days, roughly 100, so the 99th percentile is the average hottest day. And so you see that the average hottest day, let's say in Europe, would warm by something like 3.5 degrees. This is the scenario RCP 4.5. And in North America, the warming was a little bit smaller, maybe three to a little more than three degrees. Now this is the CMIP 4.5, so this uh, RCP 4.5 scenario, which is a, a scenario that assumes that the radiative forcing associated with greenhouse gases and aerosols would not exceed 4.5 watts per square meter. And maybe another scenario is the 8.5 scenario, which assumes that this forcing could go to 8.5, and which is, a, is a, about a factor three in anthropogenic aerosol concentrations in the atmosphere compared to the 280 ppm pre-industrial. And you see that in this scenario now, there were these warming, so this is another scale, so the hottest summer day would change by six or so degrees, both in North America and in, in uh, Europe. Now we can see whether these models, they also have this variability increase, and I show this yeah, here for the scenario 4.5 and here for the scenario 8.5. And I think if you look at the 8.5, maybe it's easier to see the pattern. There is indeed a, a variability increase in both North America and Europe, but in North America it's much smaller, maybe only 10, 15, 20%, while in Europe we see this, this area with a very strong variability increase. Is this based on only one model or it's... Yep, good question. Yeah. So all models available at the time of analysis, I think 25 or something like that. 
So it's a large set of models. And you use all the models? Too. All the models, yeah. So it's an average of all models? It's an average over all the models. So we think that we actually should constrain because some of the models must obviously be wrong wow. because they have a poor representation of today's natural variability. And so we did that in some other studies. I think there is a slide from that. And so if you remove these models, actually, the, the, the results might change. In general, actually, it, it yields a stronger increase. Yeah. Other question? Is this percentage change with respect to the, the change, like you were talking about before, in the, when you scaled it yeah. with the, the mean change, the variability of the mean change, or is this percentage of the old variability? So this is the uh, mean change with respect to the variability in the control period. So 30% means that the, uh, the variability increases by 30% compared to the control period. You can also see that in North America we have kind of a somewhat strange issue because here we have kind of a much more solid signal and this is one of the differences we find when looking at the North American climate and the European climate that over North America the models they disagree to a larger extent than over Europe for the summer period. And I show you a few slides to highlight actually why I think that is the case. You see, for instance, that here in the weak, mild scenario, you have a stronger variability increase in a large portion of uh, uh, northeast US compared to the, the heavy increase. Of it. So it's the other way. You would expect it the other way around. And um, lo a lot of this has to do with the difficulties of these models to simulate the North American precipitation climate. And you see the, this here in, just to show you the disagreement, precipitation projections from North America for now four different GCMs and it's only, it's only the near term 2040 to 70 versus 1970 to 20, 2000 and you can get this from some websites maintained by the NCAP project. And you see here the two so three American models and one European models. And you see that two of these models, they have a general moistening, more precipitation over much of continental US, of certainly the, the latter part of the country, while two GCMs, they project the drying by substantial amounts, maybe one or so millimeters. So there is an intrinsic difference between these models to a much larger extent than this is the case in Europe. And so I, I'm not sure whether this has been tested, but one hypothesis is that this is the result of the sensitivity of the North American climate with respect to the ENSO. We have already seen that some of these heat waves then can directly be tied to La Nina years. And so if that variability, that means not to represent the North American uh, variability, you need to have, do a much better job on ENSO that you need to do that for Europe. So Europe is far away from ENSO and we know that there is not, no strong coherent signal in the uh, ENSO signal over Europe. So this is one of the issues that uh, need to be looked at carefully. Now I maybe skip two slides. So we have also looked uh, over Europe this question, this mean warming versus extreme. So this is now from a little older paper again. So here you see now the mean warming and how does the mean warming compare against the extremes? And so if you actually look at the 99th percentile two meter change, then you see that this maximum warming is located further north than the mean warming. Meaning the heat waves, the he days with very high temperatures, they, they will change more dramatically further north. And the difference between these two figures is, is exactly what is due to this variability change. So the variability change is, has a, is centered further north compared to the mean warming and will imply that the short term uh, events will also uh, warm stronger further north. This pattern, it's important to understand what this percentile means. So this is the 99th percentile with respect to a local temperature. That means this might be bad in some locations and good in others. To put it in this way, 
depending on where your 99th percentile is. So it's, not an, uh, it's a relative threshold, and it will only say you something about the change. So to get around that, we look here now what we call at high impact heat waves, where we require that the apparent temperature is above some threshold, 41 degrees, and the apparent temperature again accounts for heat waves, uh, heat stress, and, temp and humidity stress. And you see that the, there are quite dram dramatic changes. So the, in the current period, in the control period, we have a few days where this threshold is exceeding, more a couple of days. And this 40.6 uh, degree threshold is actually the threshold that is used in the US as a health threat. And uh, so this is used in the warning statements of NOAA and other agencies. And so in Europe, actually, we are in the current climate kind of well treated because we have only typically a few summer days that are past this limit. But you see, if this comes true, that every third summer day will become like that in a large area. Now you see that there is a very complicated pattern of these changes. And this pattern, it can actually, you see it here again, it can be tied to the low altitude river basins and coastlines. So you see the major rivers, the Rhone, down here, the Po, the Danube, the Ebro. So the major rivers, river basins, the low altitude regions, they have higher temperatures and they are more likely that to, to pass this threshold of 40.6 degrees. And we find that this geographical pattern is actually consistent with all model chains and health indices considered. So it doesn't really matter whether we use this particular health index, index apparent temperature. One can use other indices and one finds the same answer, that it's these low altitude river basins and coastlines that are affected most. Now, I have already highlighted some issues about the land surface coupling, and I should first maybe look at this from, a, from an atmospheric point of view. So what you see here are cross-sections over a sea land contrast in winter. And in winter, of course, we have cold temperatures over land, comparatively warm temperatures over sea. And so what we have uh, here is a density stratification, meaning that in winter the atmosphere runs over the continent and doesn't take notice, or significantly notice, in general at least, of what is happening below, because it's shielded by, by, strong, by, by surface inversions and strong stability. While in summer, and this means that some SST variability must play an important role in affecting the interannual variations. While in summer the situation is kind of opposite, where we will have warm temperatures, a cold, comparatively cold temperatures over sea and warm temperatures over land. And we actually couple the land surface to the deep atmosphere by convection. So there is convection over land with a diurnal cycle. And that means that another element comes into play, and this is the soil moisture variability, which plays an important role in governing or kind of coupling the atmosphere to the surface. And of course, that brings a lot of additional elements in our system, which are complicated. We need to account for soil moisture content, the terrestrial water balance. We need to think of how the energy, uh, the available energy at the surface is made available into sensible and latent heat flux. So the decisive question is, how is the net radiation, which is the sum of short wave and long wave radiation, how it's that spent into sensible and latent heat fluxes. And you see that in the global mean, actually, 80% of that energy goes into the latent heat, and only 20%, one, or actually one-sixth, goes into the sensible heat. And it, doing that well would also mean that one has to have an idea of how soil moisture develops as a function of time, how evapotranspiration runoff, and so on, affects that. And the, so we think that this actually explains some of these variability issues. And so the variability issue is explained by the fact that we have here another threshold effect, which is the wilting point. So what you see here is the soil moisture evolution from spring to fall. And so typically, the amplitude of that 
on land mass is about 150 millimeters, which corresponds to maybe a couple of, f f around 40 watts over a period of three months. So it's a huge number that is available. And this huge number is actually available for cooling. So we, 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 this is the cooling rate that uh, evaporation can act on soil temperature. Now if we get, if you are close to the wilting point and so uh, uh, extract a little bit more moisture from the soil means that we will run into this threshold effect, meaning we cannot lower the soil moisture uh, contributions any deeper. So, and I show you first for the European wheat wave that it, this is really a signal or a feature that is relevant. So what you see here are now simulations for four heat waves from 76, 94, 2003, and 2005. And you see, maybe it's quicker to see down here the number of nights, uh, number of hot days where the T max is larger than the 90th percentile. And you see that, uh, so the first heat wave in 76 is referred to as the UK heat wave, or the England heat wave actually. Then this heat wave stretched parts of the Mediterranean coast and the Alpine region. This is the 2003 heat wave, which uh, is affected Spain, France, Switzerland, parts of Austria, Germany, and Italy. And this was a 2005 heat wave, which uh, was uh, kind of smaller, but fairly similar in the location. And the top diagram shows you now the observations at the station's locations, and you see that these simulations, which are driven by, lateral, by true data as a lateral boundary. So we use a regional model and drive this model by true data as a lateral boundary. And you see that in general, these simulations capture what is going on, like here, UK and parts of France, and here the extent of the heat wave 2005, uh, 2003. Now if we redo these experiments now, so we redo these experiments, but we don't allow the soil moisture to dry out. But we actually prescribe the soil moisture at climatological levels. And this is very similar to experiments where you prescribe the sea surface temperature in this effect, but you do it with the land. And if one does that, the, so this is the simulations with the dynamic land surface coupling, and this is without land surface coupling. And you see that most of the heat waves, they lose not completely, but they lose a lot of their strengths. <coughs> so we have uh, still, th this would still be a heat wave, but compared to the observed heat wave in 2003, which is large area, uh, affected area, it would be much smaller. Actually, Switzerland would not be affected by, seriously affected by this kind of heat wave. And this is the case for all three heat waves, meaning that the soil moisture, kind of spring soil moisture, it plays a key role for these heat waves. And there, I should say, yeah, that there is one study which shows that, which showed that using uh, only observational data, Ben Seitschik from the group of uh, Ron Smith, comparing a case in August 2000 against this heat wave, August 2003, and looking here at active vegetation and soil, soil temperature below. And what you see is here that in the forests in this area here, they were able to remain active, while a lot of the fields and agricultural area kind of vegetation shut down evapotranspiration, and as a result, the NDVI, this active vegetation index, decreased quite dramatically. Now you see the associated uh, impact on temperature that actually in these areas here, soil temperatures measure, measured from from the Astro satellite actually rose by 20 degrees in comparison to the August three years ago, while over the forests where this forest still remained active and evaporated water, the difference was almost 10 degrees smaller. Now if we look into these uh, soil moisture issues, it's not only, we, we need to recognize that it's a complicated chain of things that happens and it's not only Soil moisture is also convection because this, uh, I've shown you this diagram before and of course the soil moisture evolution will strongly be affected by the, the soil water balance. 
So just think of this as it would represent a patch of soil accumulating everything over the depths. And the, the, so the rate of change of soil moisture stored in this, in this piece of volume would be determined precipitation, evapotranspiration, and runoff. And all three of these are not easy uh, quantities. So it's not so evident how runoff will change when soil moisture change. And certainly not evident with precipitation and evapotranspiration. And so I come to believe that this precipitation response to changes in soil moisture is one of the keys behind understanding the climate change in the middle latitudes. So we have here, uh, let's assume that we would like to know how precipitation change with soil moisture. And this, and I show you in the next slide why this is so important. So actually assume that the soil gets drier. And if the soil gets drier and precipitation would increase then, then of course it would, would equilibrate soil moisture or try to restore soil moisture to more normal levels. I'm putting it here. So in this case, we would refer to a positive feedback, where actually more precipitation falls over the wet soils. We refer to this as a positive feedback, while a negative feedback would be the other way around, where more precipitation would fall over dry soil. And so the, you find a, a disagreement in the published literature which two of these effects dominates. And uh, so the positive feedback, it would actually it's decisive whether this feedback is positive or negative because the positive feedback would amplify the hydrological response to climate change. So if an area gets drier, then it would mean precipitation will reduce as a result of the drying and it would become even drier. So it's a positive feedback. While a negative feedback would moderate the hydrological response to climate change because if an area would get drier, precipitation would increase as a result of this drying in soil moisture. And this would moderate it. And so you think that, of course, one favors the kind of the left-hand picture because one would argue that more precipitation and uh, more soil moisture, more water in the soil would also allow more precipitation. But in fact, there are a number of studies and the opinion on this is... Uh, is not the same. So there are a lot of uncertainties due to the complex change of processes that are involved. And one of the complexities that is involved here is that this, a lot of this precipitation, which we are interested in, is in the form of convective precipitation with a strong diurnal cycle. And I show you a nice uh, example here. So this is, shows you diurnal convection over Europe is a three-day stretch, and it shows you how on each day this, uh, oops, I hope this works. Yeah. yeah, it shows on each day how the convection starts. You see, so now it's the first day, second day, third day. So we have a diurnal cycle in the con convection or in precipitation signal mean that we are looking at the pulsating phenomena which uh, extends over large areas uh, all of Europe and also substantial parts of North America. It's fairly similar. So what we, and then we have to recall that precipitation is convective precipitation is, is parametrized. So we parametrize all of this with uh, some sensitivities which we maybe have a problem. So what we try to do is to investigate whether the soil moisture precipitation feedback was, a, was the same, modeled the same way in uh, low resolution models where we would use a convection scheme, here the con TK convection scheme, or in high resolution model where we would explicitly simulate the convection. And so we're doing this type of simulations and we are using just simply wet and dry uh, soil moisture initial conditions to see whether precipitation in such simulations increases or decreases. So a positive feedback would mean that the wet simulations, the wet initial conditions, would have more precipitation than the control and uh, substantially more than the dry initial conditions. And I show you maybe first just a few looks at how these simulations compare. So I show you here now a precipitation field over covering 
the uh, alpine region and you see on the right hand side the low resolution results of 25 kilometers for the same months and on the left hand side you see now the convective precipitation which shows them maybe not realistic but more realistic signature than what you see on the left hand side so you see the diurnal convection in some of these things now we have a phase of diurnal convection and then another synoptic system is moving in right now now we don't argue with these simulations that the details of this convective uh, that the distribution of these convective cells is realistic so we think there must be errors but we think or we hope that actually we can do look at this feedback in a bulk fashion I show you maybe another look at some of the clouds how these clouds look now a perspective view in a small area of these model simulations and you see those clouds that are resolved explicitly and you see that in the seven kilometer models which we use as a comparison here the majority of clouds cannot be represented and if you display also the parameterized clouds then most modelers get kind of a slight trauma because they see how bad their clouds look <laughs> these are convective clouds in a parameterized model maybe it's if you use such models maybe it's worthwhile looking at how these clouds look and we know that that uh, this explicit this representation of these clouds has some big, big advantages in particular we can have a much better si representation of the diurnal cycle so on the in black you see now the diurnal cycle from 0 to 24 UTC and you see this afternoon convective peak which is in the evening hour while the parameterized convection has this signal much too early typically around noon so and this is a characteristic problem well known for actually all parameterization schemes I'm aware of and so this bias can be corrected with explicit convection we can actually use that also to study other factors but maybe skip that here so here we now look at the results for this month long integration so this was one month which at the lateral boundaries was driven by the observed uh, conditions of the atmosphere and we simulate each of these panels as three simulations one where we have a dry initial soil and one where we have a wet initial soil and this the dry and wet is kind of at the uh, outposts of natural variability and black is the control and you see that this already now that you, you see here now this pulsating convection which happens every day so this is a mean area average precipitation amounts now if you summarize all of that at the mean as the mean diurnal cycle you get a surprising result namely that the mean diurnal cycle of precipitation in the parameterized and in the explicit model has a different sign it's not only a different amplitude but a different sign so what we see here for the dry soil and uh, for the low resolution model with parameterized convection that we have a positive feedback because the moist soil produces more precipitation the dry soil less precipitation while in the two kilometer simulations we have the dry soil produces more precipitation and the moist soil produces less precipitation and so a very puzzling result and what can understand it actually or that it's consistent with the literature which has proposed that such a negative feedback is possible because you can have deeper thermals uh, because you have more energy in and you can have deeper thermals and trigger convection in circumstances where you would not be able over a, a moist soil and so for this month and this uh, region it doesn't need to be the same we have diff a different opinion of these uh, two models about the feedback and situation is even worse actually if we now look at the same now for a whole set of models this one being the explicit parameterization and then form four simulations with different convection schemes then you see that each convection scheme has its own mood <laughs> as to say like the TK is positive the TK cape closure has a, is also positive but slightly smaller kind fridge is a kind of almost neutral the kind fridge Bechtold again is positive and you all even find some uh, I know actually this is negative the kind which is negative 
And so there are big differences between the, those different schemes. And we have done these experiments or part of these experiments twice. So below here, we use the same model now, the same dynamical core, but with another model version, meaning a lot of changes have been made. The typical thing you have to upgrade to a model. And so these changes between these two model releases is maybe five years in work, so it's quite substantial difference. So and we repeated some of these experiments down here, and you see that qualitatively the, the character of each convection scheme is maintained. So the character of a convection scheme is very strong and maintained over other model changes. So we can say that this uh, uncertainty is uh, evident across a wide range of convection parameterizations. And what we are trying to do is really to get rid of this uncertainty by doing, by trying to simulate some of these climate simulations with uh, cloud resolve, at cloud resolving resolutions. Now I should say be to, as a form of lookout, as one would like to use these cloud resolving models for climate studies, I should also point out another advantage, namely the question, do climate models converge? And the, this issue is always, has always been an important item in regular or normal modeling studies, where one would request that if we refine the numerical resolution, that the re sol solution should converge. And it's very hard to do these convergence experiments with parameterized convection because you, actually we know that we would, it would violate the implicit assumptions. But we, you can do these convergence tests now in, for the cloud resolving models. And you, I show you here results from a very recent paper where we zoom in now into one area here. And the colors you see here are the clouds, vertically integrated cloud moisture content. And you see that the, these clouds, they depend, they, they strongly depend actually on the resolution. It's what you would expect actually, that the 4.4 kilometer clouds are much larger and smoother than the 500 meter kilometer clouds. So certainly the, the simulations don't converge in structure. So the structure that we obtain, they, they are very different. But if we actually compute the bulk convergence property, meaning the way how these clouds and these clouds heat the atmosphere, for instance, or moisten the atmosphere, we find that they essentially deliver the, the same type of thing. So there is this astounding degree of convergence despite that there are large sensitivity with respect to structure. Okay, I think that was my last slide with contents. Yeah, so here's a summary. So we have seen that heat waves have very significant societal impacts already today. And uh, it's quite likely that they will become even more relevant with climate change. And temperatures that appear extremely hot or unthinkable and unusual today, they might become quite common in the future if you think that 8 degrees warmer or 6 degrees warmer, this is in the scale of climate change, and very hot summer temperatures could result. There is some evidence from the models and observations and understanding that in some regions climate warming will also be accompanied by increases in variability. And so the inc changes in heat wave is not only the warming signal alone, but we need to account for changes in the whole statistical distribution. And from that we think according to current models that Europe will be uh, strongly affected. We've also seen that regional projections still have Larger, I would even say large uncertainties. It depends also to some extent on the region. And uh, it's key issues that here require further assessment are land surface processes and moist convection. But we have also seen that in, for some areas, this inability to have model agreement stems from the oceanic part of the Earth system model and may be a remote ocean that deflects the climate. Yeah. I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> We have some time for questions, and then we finish questions. Uh, refreshments are served in 102 compliments of YCDI. Questions for Christoph? Yes. So this model considered the relationship between CO2 and plant evapotranspiration? 
the relationship between between CO2 and evapotranspiration as, as CO2 goes not, up the not actually yeah no good question so here we use the fairly simple um, for most of the simulations you have seen for some of the CME5 simulations I think there are simulations that do that but for the auto simulations for the ritual simulations there is no relationship and there re that this is a, an issue that is of uh, concern and should be looked into as well I agree so you the point that is being made is that changes in CO2 concentration might change plant evapotranspiration and thereby affect these things as well. The, the stomata don't open as far with a higher CO2, is that the idea? So the no, but it's more the water use species. So the plants tend to use less water to do the same amount right. of photosynthesis right. as the CO2 right. through many different processes. Mm -hmm. Bill. You focused on this, this sort of small-scale interactions between soil and moisture and yeah. transpiration and atmospheric moist convection. Not knowing anything, I would have actually guessed that, that one of the other potentially very important controls on heat waves would be the statistics of the large-scale atmospheric yeah. flow patterns, yeah. you know, extra tropical barrel yeah. hunting eddies, things yeah. like that. Do, do those play any role yeah. whatsoever? Good, <coughs> uh, good point. So <laughs> I've I think what we see from these models actually is that in the, like if you do the average over all models, then you see that the summer variability is not changed dramatically, but there are some reductions in winter variability. And these reductions in winter variability are interpreted by the fact that the north-south temperature gradient is kind of, will be stimulated to become smaller. And so, uh, and there is more moisture in the atmosphere, so actually smaller or weaker cyclones in the average. A smaller number of cyclones is able to maintain the north-south uh, temperature gradient. But uh, so to make to answer your question on the other direction is that we don't think that the models are good enough to make projections of these uh, variability, the, the synoptic scale changes, because they are, have a huge problem, for instance, in predicting blocking, blocking frequencies, which of course are relevant for, for heat waves, the extended heat wave circuit. Question in the back. Okay. Kind of for comparison, you chose the two time period from 1961 to 1990, and you chose 2071 and 2100. Is there any specific reason to choose 2071 to 2000? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just a tradition because our simulations, or many of these simulations, they end in 2100. We had to agree on a protocol. And in this protocol, the normal stop of simulation is 2,100 for a large set of simulations. Some of them are continued. Between the gestrin and the strong trap position, the only in the Arctic sea ice situation, because uh, definitely there exists a big difference in basic state that might affect the, the heat wave situation. Yeah. Well, so. What is certainly done also, so there are studies, I showed some diagrams as well for intermediate periods like 2040 to 2070. And the next IPCC report will actually have a chapter, chapter 11, on near-term climate change, which will only look up to 2050. But for some of these studies, it's quite clear that, of course, the signal-to-noise ratio is smaller if you look at the next 30 or 40 years. Actually, the part of natural variability, which we cannot predict, will grow in proportion. So it will be hard to show a clear signal for the next 20 or so years. Yeah. Uh, I was curious, uh, in your simulations, when you looked at the European heat wave and the role of soil moisture, I assume that was done with a regional model that yeah. had the yeah. convection parameterized. That's right. Yeah. So uh, do you suspect that those simulations were done with a cloud-resolving yeah. model, that the sensitivity would be smaller, that soil moisture yeah. would be less. Yeah, that could be the case. So also it's clear that these models, I mean, those that aren't using these models, they should know that these are huge apparatus. And so basically you have to rely on a community to generate a model that, to some extent, you need to do that. And so it's also clear that all of these models in some way are tuned, implicitly or explicitly so that the model produces nice results we, in mean quantities is, is a tunable issue to some extent. But uh, I, I think 
to tune a heat wave actually is much more difficult to do that. So we will see how the, what the results say. Maybe also the months that we started for this uh, soil moisture precipitation feedback was one specific month that maybe had an odd behavior compared to the average. We don't know. No. Less? Given the, exactly what you just said and the fact that the fully coupled CMIP5 GCMs are you know, 100 kilometer grid scale uh, for one grid box and so everything is parameterized, the soil moisture yeah. is set free to do what it wants yeah. for 100 years. How much faith do you have on the variability estimate at the end of that, at, at the end of yeah. these simulations when all you have to compare it to is yeah. what we have now where I, I think there is some limitations in my face in these variability issues. We, we have done a lot of analysis and we, uh, on this, the representation of variability. We had a paper just recently in GRL where we look into that again with another ensemble of models, the so-called ensembles models. And there we see that these models have generally a tendency to overestimate the variability from these uh, processes, which would actually be in line with the fact that the soil moisture precipitation feedback could be less positive than the models assume. So that would actually reduce the variability. So most of the models actually overestimate the variability. Christoph, in the first part of your talk, you showed that that variability bullseye shifts up into the northern parts of, of yeah. Europe. Is that, what, what explains that? Is that a, okay. is that a um, soil moisture threshold yeah. that's been crossed up there where suddenly you're drying things out where you didn't before? That's right, yeah. So the idea, so we, I didn't talk about that in more detail, but the soil moisture threshold, it will not really be important in a very Mediterranean climate where you actually cross the threshold anyway every year. So it will not be a fundamental change to the climate with climate change. But in the intermediate zone where you, in the current climate, you rarely exceed this threshold but in the future, we will do so maybe every second year. It will add to the variability that gives you the, gives you the, the flip. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, one more here. So in, in these models, the, the volume of ice during summer in the northern hemisphere is, is part of the boundary condition? Yeah. So because we are entering in a phase where we don't have an analog for the last, you know, <laughs> yeah. years. So yeah, so it's true. So for most of the simulations, like the, the, so if we do the current climate simulation, then uh, now I need to be careful on, the, on which model. So on the GCMs, which are also used to drive the scenarios from the regional models, of course they have an ice module and they are coupled atmosphere ocean GCMs. So their northern hemisphere ice extent may, may be odd with from observation, so uh, I, there is validation around for that parameter, but I don't know how it looks like. But there is a dynamical ice sheet in these models. I mean, the, the, the sea ice, yeah, the sea ice is dynamically treated in the coupled models and may be overestimated or underestimated. So compared to current observations, most models actually, they underestimate the retreat of the Arctic sea ice. Most of the models have a much slower retreat than has been observed, at least in the last 20 years. 